It's good to see everybody today. Let's begin in the book of Psalms. Book of Psalms. Uh, for those of you who may be new with us this morning, uh, we are taking a survey approach through God's Word. We began at the beginning of this year, and we're going back and forth a little bit from Old Testament to New Testament. So we recently finished the book of Exodus. And so we are going to spend a little time in the book of Psalms, and then we'll move uh, after that into the book of Acts. And so uh, working our way through God's Word. Now, you, if you are familiar with the book of Psalms, you know that uh, it is actually not one book, but five books. The first section is uh, Psalms 1 through 41, and so that's the portion that we'll cover over the next several weeks. And then we'll save some, uh, some other portions of Psalms for next year and the year after as we work systematically uh, through the whole Bible. But this morning, beginning in Psalm 1, uh, we, uh, we're going to see a series of prayers, of, of really expressions of the heart crying out to God. Uh, the song, some of the songs that we sang this morning are so appropriate for these passages because uh, these psalms are prayers. They're actually really songs that were sung in Israel. And uh, they had many authors. Many of the psalms were written by David. Uh, some were written by Solomon, by Moses, by, uh, by others, and Asaph and, and other worship leaders in Israel. Should I change... Right there? We'll try that? Alright. Um, I can go to handheld. Wanna do that? Let's do the handheld. So these psalms, uh, many different authors, but uh, they're poetry, they're, they're song lyrics, they're artistic expressions. And if you've not delved into the Psalms before and recognized or been able to appreciate really the beauty of expression and the depth of expression in the scriptures, it's absolutely amazing. Now, in English poetry, uh, English song lyrics, we rely on rhyme. We, we re rely on recurring sounds, you know, to, uh, to carry the, the flow of thought. In Hebrew poetry, it's different. Uh, rather than rely on particular sounds or rhymes uh, in the poetry, uh, Hebrew poetry is built on images. It's, it's built on parallels, uh, recurring images, parallel thoughts, parallel structures. And one of the amazing things about that is that the ideas and the beauty of, of Hebrew poetry are then able to be translated into English and into other languages. It's a universal uh, kind of structure that can be appreciated and, and understood. And so God's Word is so rich in this regard. So this morning, uh, we're going to begin now in Psalm 1. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night night. Blessed is the man. Literally, happy. Happy is the man. Right? And so, so the psalmist talks about this happiness, and, and this is a happiness that results not just from high emotions or good circumstances, but this is a happiness uh, or a joy that's the result of God's work in a person's life. And I would suggest to you that this kind of happiness that that is written of here, uh, this is a, a kind of happiness that you can have even when you're tired, right? A, a blessedness even when you're exhausted, or a blessedness even when things are not really well in your life, your circumstances are difficult, yet you can still have this kind of, of blessedness or happiness in your heart, right? So this is what the psalmist is talking about. And, and the first way he describes this happy person is in the negative, he says, this is the person who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, who doesn't stand in the path of sinners, who doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. And just in those three phrases, we start to see this parallelism that we talked about. 
how these images build one on top of another. And in this case, what we get is actually something of a progression, right? We should notice that progression here from walking to uh, standing to sitting. It's, it's, it's a progression into a, into a settled state. And, and in, this, in the negative sense here, this is a picture of how people really drift away from the Lord. You know, we don't just usually take a hard right turn or a hard left turn and, and depart the faith or, or lose our connection with the Lord. It's usually a gradual thing. And that's sort of the picture here. That um, uh, first um, of, of just starting to take on the world's philosophies and the world's ideas and surrounding yourself in close relationships with those who are ungodly and eventually becoming just entrenched in that, seated in that place with the scornful, resting there, right? But then we get the positive. But his delight, the blessed man doesn't do those things, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. But who might think he, in his law, he, he soaks in God's word. When it talks about his law, it's just talking about the scriptures, God's word. The righteous man, the happy man, the blessed man, or the blessed person soaks themselves in the Word of God and walks in the Word of God. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Right? You know, here's the thing. Prayer is wonderful in the Christian life, but it's not enough. Worship is wonderful in the Christian life, but it's not enough. Caleb, Power 88, whatever you have streaming <laughs> into your car, can be a blessing. It's not enough. Right? Blessed is the man, right, whose delight is in the law of God. We need the word of God to saturate our hearts and our minds and live that out. That's what brings strength. Look at verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The issue here is maturity. A, a, a life that, that bears fruit, that's mature, that, that brings sweet fruit, that, that's good. And, and, you know, we think of fruit in, in Christian terms, uh, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the qualities of character of the life of a believer, right? And we, we know these in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But these fruits of the Spirit... Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the character of Christ. This is what, see, as we soak in God's Word, what happens is our character is changed. Our person is changed from the inside out. And so, as our character changes, then we're also fruitful not just in exhibiting the uh, Christ-likeness, but then those are the people God uses and we become effective in serving Him and doing whatever it is He's called us to do, whether it's in our normal roles of life, being a mom, being a dad, being a worker, being a boss, right? We become more effective in those things, shining the light of Christ, um, but also in, in maybe service in the church and, and, and working God's kingdom and sharing, uh, sharing the truth and sharing the gospel message with people who need it out in the world, right? It not it hard to receive something good from an angry person? The only way to, to be happy around an angry person is to also be angry. <laughs> right? But that's not to be the character of God's people. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And then that gives us opportunity, makes us effective as we communicate the truth of God with those that are around us. So fruitfulness comes from this. Look at verse 4. The ungodly, though, are not so. So we get these contrasts. We So often in this Hebrew poetry, it's parallelism and it's contrast. We get this contrast. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So the ungodly... Think about how stable and firm that tree is. I mean, its leaf will not wither. So, like, it's resilient. 
Even in difficult times, the person who soaked in God's word will still be strong and steadfast. And in complete opposite, uh, opposition to that, or completely different from that, is the ungodly. They're like the chaff. Now, if you're not familiar with chaff, when they would harvest their grain, their barley or wheat or whatever, and they would harvest their grain, you'd have to rub the grain together, and that breaks away the outer hull around the grain so you can get to the, the kernel that's, that's good. And that outer hull is, is basically worthless. And you would rub it and, and loosen it, and then they would throw the grain up into the air in a stiff breeze, and the wind would blow, and it would separate that worthless outer hull, that dry chaff. It would blow it away, and then the good grain would fall down, and they could collect it and use it. Right? So that's the picture. The ungodly are like that chaff that are worthless, and they get blown away. They have no standing. They have no resiliency. They have no permanency. Right? And they will not stand in God's judgment at the end. That's the picture. They will not... Therefore, the ungodly, verse 5, shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So it's a wasted life. It's a, it's a life that falls ultimately under judgment. The Word of God, so essential to our stability and our maturity and our fruitfulness. All right, now let's look at Psalm 2. It's interesting, we get all these different... Instead of one theme, we get all these different themes as we go through the Psalms. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his appointed, saying, excuse me, against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Are the nations of the world angry? Well, they're angry with each other. But there's going to come a point in time where they are consciously angry, not just against each other, but they are angry with God. And they reject openly His rule. And the psalm is going to talk about the anointed one who's going to rule over them anyway. This is a messianic psalm. The word Messiah literally means the anointed one. And so here, they rage against the Lord and against his anointed, against his Messiah, against Jesus. Right? And, and, and this psalm speaks prophetically of that time when Jesus is going to return. Jesus will return. He told his disciples that he was going to come back. The scriptures prophesy about the return of the Lord, and Jesus will indeed return. And when he returns, the world is not going to be happy. They are not going to want to accept his rule. Right? He will be opposed. But, look at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. So when God comes back, he will come back to rule and to reign and he will judge those who oppose him. Think battle of Armageddon. When we go to Israel, we're going to stand up on the mountain. We're going to look over the valley where the battle of Armageddon will take place. Right? Prophesying of this future event. Verse 6, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So God's speaking here. Jesus will reign from Jerusalem. That's the holy hill of Zion. And then in the next line, we read a declaration from, from the Messiah himself, from the Lord himself. He says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. This means that when Jesus rules from Jerusalem for a thousand years, as Revelation talks about, it will be, as it says, with a rod of iron, which means it will be with righteousness that is strictly enforced. Nobody is going to get away with anything. And Revelation 20 also tells us that we, the church, we will reign with Christ. We will reign with Him. 
And we will be resurrected in our new bodies. Praise God. I just look forward more and more to the new body every birthday. Just looking forward to the new body. Happy about that. Listen to Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. The first resurrection and the second death. So, so the first resurrection is the resurrection of the righteous. That those are all those who put their faith in Christ who are raised again and they have a new body like the body of Jesus at his ascension. Right? Blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection. There's a second resurrection. That's the resurrection of the ungodly who will stand before God's throne. So you want to be part of the first resurrection, not the second resurrection, right? Blessed are those who are part of the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. There are two resurrections and there are two deaths. The first death is the physical death where our spirit is separated from this body. Right? That's the first death. Right? We're, everybody's going to experience in some form or fashion the first death. But the second death is the one you want to avoid because the second death is the separation of our spirit from the Lord, at least from living in his life and in his light. Okay? Death is about separation. The first one is separating the spirit from the body. The second one is separating the spirit from God's life. Right? But blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection. They shall not experience the second death. And... But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So we're going to reign with Jesus on the earth for a thousand years. I'm putting in for Fiji. <laughs> you put in whatever you want to put in for, but I don't know if I'll get it. But man, Lord, can I serve you in Fiji? That would be okay with me. And in my new body, I won't sunburn, so I'm, I'm good. All right, verse 10. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. So as the psalmist looks forward to the reign of the Messiah, and he calls out the wicked kings and rulers of the earth who will oppose him, and they will be judged, now he gives a word of warning to those who will reign and be in power in the millennium. During the reign of Christ, he says, don't do what the first kings did. Right? Submit yourself to God. Serve the Lord with reverence. And rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. Honor Him. Right? So looking forward to the perfect reign of Christ. And the perfect obedience that He will establish. Praise God. Just elections, chaos, wars. There is coming a day when there will be peace on the earth. And it will be because King Jesus reigns from Jerusalem. Put your hope in him. All right, Psalm 3. Psalm 3, verse 1. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Now, we read a lot of these psalms and we don't always know the context or the circumstance in which they were written. But here is a case where we do get uh, a word on when and why this was written. This psalm was written by King David, and it was written when his son Absalom tried to take the throne. We know that David was running for his life when this happened. He and his court and those who were loyal to him in Jerusalem had to flee out of the city. Right? You can go read of that in 2 Samuel chapter 15 if you want. But Absalom, one of David's sons, was angry. The, the backstory here is that his sister had been sexually assaulted by their brother. Absalom killed the brother. And then David banished Absalom because of it. And for a long time. And, and someone had to intervene for Absalom to be uh, brought back to Jerusalem and, and reconnected with his father. And this made Absalom very bitter. So that's the cause of all this trouble. But there's something more. Which is 2 Samuel chapter 12 tells us that this whole family drama, uh, all this trouble that David's going through, is actually a judgment on him allowed by God because of his sin with Bathsheba and his killing of her husband Uriah. 
Remember, he commits adultery with Bathsheba. He arranges for her husband Uriah, who was one of his, his loyal soldiers, to be killed in battle. And when Nathan the prophet confronted David about his sin, and David ultimately did repent, but when he confronted David, he also gave him this message from God. It says this in 2 Samuel 12. He says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son, as he went in broad daylight. Indeed, the very first thing that we read about when Absalom comes into Jerusalem, the first thing that he does is to make a public spectacle of bringing out his father's concubines who had been left behind. Right? And David and those who are loyal to him are on the run, and, and they're going to be pursued, and there's going to be a fight. Right? The amazing thing about this song is that David is going to be crying out to God and asking for God's help in this circumstance. So think about that. Rather than just resign himself that this is God's judgment and I just need to put my head down and take it, he has faith enough to call out and ask the Lord for mercy, even in the middle of it, even though it's his own fault and he deserves it. David understood the goodness of God. That even when he's suffering the consequences of his own sin, he knows the Lord's mercy is still available to him. That's a good lesson for us. And then the second most amazing thing about this psalm is that God is going to answer him. And God is going to give him mercy and actually deliver him from Absalom. So let's read about this. He says there at the second part of verse 1, he says, Lord... How they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. So all those around David have given up. Right? All those around him uh, look at him and say, oh, well, he's a lost cause. You know, he, he brought this on himself, perhaps. God's judging him. You know, stay away from him. But David still cries out to the Lord. We should never lose faith to pray. We should never lose faith to pray. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord of my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. Well, when we, that's the second time we've read that. When we read that word, Selah, it, it means to pause, as in there's a pause in the music or a break in the music. But we also probably get the idea that it's an opportunity for us to reflect on what's just been said or sung and, and to meditate on that truth, right? Here, even though David was far from the temple, right? Understanding the, temp, uh, the tabernacle, the temple in Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant, they would pray toward Jerusalem when they were away from it. David is far because he's running. But yet he finds out God is not far from him. He feels far from God, but God is not far from him. He says, he says, he has heard me from his holy hill. And then he says this, verse 5, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. You can imagine perhaps on some level being in David's shoes, being on the run, being in danger, full of anxiety. At risk of being literally attacked. And then he said, I was able to lay down and rest. God gave him peace enough to sleep and protect him while he was vulnerable. Right? That's what God does for us. He says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, the Lord, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessings upon your people. Selah. So God gives David and his men victory. And this is it. You can go back to 2 Samuel and read of that. But he, he says, salvation, verse 8, belongs to the Lord. That's just David's way of saying, God, it was all you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It's all you. He gave the Lord full credit, full acknowledgement. 
for his mercy. It's all you and no one else. All right, Psalm 4, verse 1. To the chief musician with stringed instruments, a psalm of David, another one of David's psalms. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. David must have spent a lot of time in trouble. <laughs> because the psalms are full of his petitions for the Lord's help. But that's an encouragement to me, because I feel like I'm in trouble a lot. A lot of my prayers are petitions for the Lord's rescue and help. Here, notice what David does. He declares that God has helped him in the past. He says, you have relieved me in my distress. That is in the past. You've, you've helped me. And then he asks his prayer for the future. So, Lord, the idea is, have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Lord, you've been faithful to me. Lord, you've helped me before. Lord, please help me now. It's always good for us in the middle of present trouble to remember God's past faithfulness. Right? How many times has the Lord come through? I would dare say no one in this room can stand up today and give a testimony of God's unfaithfulness. It's not possible because He is faithful. Even when things are not yet, not yet resolved, he is still faithful to carry us in the circumstance and in the moment. So David says, you've delivered me in the past, Lord, you will deliver, you know, hear my prayer now. Right? Verse 2. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Selah. So now David, poetically, speaking to his, his enemies. And the idea here, I think, is that uh, David's trouble is he's being slandered. People who love falsehood, who would speak against him, right? His reputation perhaps is under attack. And he says, how long? He says, but know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. And now David is going to turn and he's going to talk to himself. He talked to his, his enemies, now he's going to talk to himself. He says, be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Selah. Be angry and do not sin. He says, meditate on your heart. David will often talk to himself in the Psalms. You know, aside from a sign of uh, that you're going crazy, talking to yourself in the right way can be healthy. We do need to remind ourselves who the Lord is and who we are in Him and what He has done for, for us. Right? And David's doing that. And now he's He's preaching to himself. He says, be angry and do not sin. Meditate on your bed. In other words, don't lash out in anger at these people, David. You need to be still. You need to think of the Lord. Right? You need to wait on God. You know, we do more damage when we respond in rage and in anger. David's holding himself back. Listen to Romans 12, 19. It says, beloved. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Right? David knows the Lord is the one who fights his battles. So he's telling himself to be still and to wait on God. And this is what else he does. Verse 5, he says, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Rather than rage against those who are attacking you, David says, I need to worship God. I need to offer the sacrifices of righteousness. I need to act in a godly way. I need to worship the Lord and my attitude and in my actions. Verse 6. He says, there are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Many people doubt. Many people doubt the goodness of God. Many people in your circumstances might doubt that God's going to come through or he's going to steer you in the right direction, or he's going to work on your behalf. But David prays, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Look toward us, Lord. He says, you have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increase. I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Here the Lord gives him gladness in his heart. You, you have put gladness in my heart, God. This is so cool. There's this, there's this huge shift right here. He's crying out, he's praying, he's, he's preaching to himself, he's, trying, he's being steady, and then all of a sudden he says, wow, Lord, 
You heard my prayer. Lord, you put gladness in my heart. David has the joy and the peace that come from God. So much so that he's able to lie down and to sleep. How wonderful that we can ask God for the peace that we need to rest. This is the second time we've seen it. We saw it in, in the third song and we've seen it here. I, I was able to lie down and sleep. Does anybody else lay awake sometimes at night full of anxiety? Worrying about circumstances? Listen, you're not alone. Right? This is a common condition of humanity. To feel overwhelmed and anxieties. What was David's cure for this? Where did he find relief when that happened in his life? And he called out to the Lord. And the Lord gave him peace. I love Psalm 127 too. We won't get there for quite a while. But it says of the Lord, He gives His beloved sleep. He gives His beloved sleep. You can ask the Lord for His peace. Not as the world gives. Right? Jesus says, He says, My peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives. Not based upon circumstances and assurances from man. But in faith in me. Psalm 5. <clears throat> to the chief musician with flutes. So stringed instruments, flutes, the whole symphony here of, of Israel's worship. Uh, a psalm of David again. David says, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. I love that. David asked the Lord to not only consider his words, but also his thoughts. You know we have the blessing of articulate communication with the creator of the universe. God wants us to be articulate. He wants us to use our words. He wants us to, to be purposeful and intelligent in our worship of him and our prayer to him. But... We also have the privilege of just lifting up a troubled heart, one that is overwhelmed with, with, uh, with emotion, one where we're not sure how to express ourselves. David says, hear my words, Lord, but, but also, Lord, understand and hear my, the meditation of my heart, right? Romans 8.26 tells us that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us, groanings which cannot be uttered. One of my very frequent prayers is, Lord, you know. Sometimes that's all I need to pray. Lord, you know. But God hears both the words and the condition of our hearts. The Holy Spirit enables and helps and and, and even intercedes for us. Look at verse 2. David says, Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. And this is the coolest imagery. David's off, obviously, this is uh, David's morning devotion time. <laughs> Lord, in the morning I'm going to pray to you. That's a great example, example for us to follow. He's beginning his day by seeking God's help. Right? And he says, I will direct my prayer to you. I, I want to read a quote to you from uh, Spurgeon, a famous 19th century preacher, about this line. Uh, this, this idea, I will direct my prayer to you. Spurgeon says, the idea behind direct is not to aim, but to order or to arrange. It is the word that is used for the laying in order of the wood and the pieces of the victim upon the altar. It is used also for the putting of the showbread upon the table. It means just this. I will arrange my prayer before thee. I will lay it out upon the altar in the morning, just as the priest lays out the morning sacrifice. And so inherent in this idea is that our prayer is a form of worship and sacrifice to the Lord, but also that it's orderly. It's laid out in a particular way. Right? That our prayers are not just a haphazard rambling. Praise God, he mercifully hears those too. But David says, I'm bringing an intentional prayer to you, a specific issue, a thing upon which I need your help and your wisdom and your direction. 
And then notice that David says after that, he says, I will direct it to you, verse 3, and I will look up. In other words, Lord, I'm going to lay this thing out before you, but then I'm going to look up and look for your answer. I'm going to look for my answer from heaven. I'm going to look for you to speak. I'm going to look for you to direct and to work. I have an expectation, God, that you're going to respond in some way to direct me in my need. That's another example for us to follow. To pray intentionally, to pray intelligently, but also to look to the Lord for an answer. Look at verse 4. He says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. So David contrasts himself with the wicked. The wicked should have no confidence with God, no standing with God in which to offer a prayer because of their wickedness, right? But David says, but I'm going to come. And notice that David doesn't say, because I'm such a great guy. He says, I come according to, the, to your mercies, Lord. According to your mercy, the multitude of your mercy. Praise God, it's not just a little mercy. Multitudes of mercy that God has for us. And, and so he's praying on the basis of God's good character. What gives any of us the right to pray to ask God for help? Well, it's not us. We probably got ourselves into this mess. But we come on the basis of who God is, His goodness, His mercy, and specifically, we as New Testament believers, we come because of the character of Jesus, and His righteousness, and His perfection, because we're in Him. I don't feel worthy to pray. Good. You're not. Until you're in Jesus. So pray on the basis of who Jesus is, and then you can come boldly to the throne of grace and ask for help in time of need, as the book of Hebrews says. So that's what David's doing here. Verse 9, for there is no faithfulness. Oh, excuse me, verse 8. He says, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. Make your way straight, Lord. Literally, David's praying what we all pray. Lord, just tell me what to do. Show me what to do. Show me the right thing to do in this situation. How to walk straight before you. Right? Make my path straight. And then he goes on, verse 9, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. For they have rebelled against you. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let them also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. So David prays and asks God to deal with his enemies. Lord, take care of them. Lord, judge them. Lord, Lord, deal with their wickedness, right? And But then he says, um, God, for your people, for me, Lord, for those who love you and know you, Lord, let us be joyful. And he says it three times there in verse 11. He talks about to rejoice, to shout for joy, to be joyful in the Lord. David is really looking forward to seeing God's work. As we talked about earlier, his prayer anticipates God's faithfulness and his goodness and deliverance. Do our prayers do that? I'm convicted. Do my prayers? Sometimes we look, Lord, help me. God, are you probably wrong? Right, that's, that's really the expression of my heart. I don't say it that way. But I'm not always confident. Yet I have every reason to be confident in God's faithfulness. To be joyful, to look forward to the joy that I'm going to have. And, and to be confident of His work in my life. Right? The director of our ministry school used to say, Faith and optimism go together. Faith and optimism. Listen. I am not a fan of the theology that says that you should never say anything negative or that you should always confess good things. That's a theology that attempts to manipulate God by my human positivity. And it relies on me 
to change my circumstances, not the Lord. So, so that's not a good theology, right? But, but, we can be optimistic. We're not, we don't need to deny reality. If things are bad, you can say, hey, things are bad. How are you today? Blessed. No, not really blessed. I'm not really blessed. That's why we just say blessed because it's the thing to say when we're not really blessed. It's okay to be honest. It's good to be honest with your circumstances and acknowledge them. But when we pray, we should also be optimistic. Hey, the Lord's going to work. I don't know how he's going to work. I don't know when he's going to work, but I know he's going to work. And I'm looking forward to his faithfulness and seeing him change these things or change me in this circumstance. We should expect to see God's faithfulness show up in our lives. Psalm 6. To the chief musician with stringed instruments, on an eight-stringed harp, a psalm of David. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. This is one of the penitent psalms, we call them. One of the psalms of repentance. And David is in a bad way here. He feels that his horrible circumstances are a result of God's correction or judgment in his life. That was the case earlier when we read about Absalom, right? Um, but the truth is, God does correct and chasten his children. Hebrews 12, 6 makes this very plain for us. It says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. God is a good father, and he will discipline his children so that they will grow into maturity. But I think there's a little wrinkle here in that David is not sure about God's ultimate feeling toward him. Do not rebuke me in your anger or chasten me in your hot displeasure. He feels like God is angry with him. But in that verse we just read from Hebrews 12, 6, it says, Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. We need to understand the Lord's love toward us is unchanging, even if he needs to allow something difficult or correct us. Right? I think there's a little difference in the Old Testament and the New Testament perspective there. David's not maybe totally sure about how God feels about him in this moment. But he's going to cry out to him and pray nonetheless. He says, verse 2, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak, O Lord. Heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? David is hurting physically. He's troubled emotionally. He talks about his bones. He talks about his soul. And he's in this very real and desperate question, Lord, how long? How long will this continue? How long will this go on? And then he says, return, O Lord, deliver me, save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. David is calling out for mercy. And then again, here we get it. Verse 8, there's a shift now. Depart from me, he says, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. This is, this is such a hard shift. He's swimming. That's the poetic language there. I'm swimming in tears. My bed is a boat. And I'm swimming in tears all night. He's in anguish. But now, here, he says, The Lord has heard my supplication. He's, he will receive my prayer. What's happened? God brought David relief. Even... If circumstances haven't changed for David, his heart has changed. And this is one of the great truths about prayer, right? One of the beautiful truths about prayer is that its benefit is not primarily about changing our circumstances, but about changing us. And you know that God can speak to your heart, and he can change your perspective, and he can give you peace, and he can set your heart free, 
And he can free you from anger and bitterness and, and any sin and any addiction. He can work in you in a moment and change you. Even if your circumstances, even if the outwards, outward things aren't moved yet. He can touch your heart and set you free and give you peace and give you joy. He can strengthen and change us even before we see our situation. Philippians 4, 6-7. through 7. What does Paul tell the church? You probably have this on a bookmark or a magnet somewhere. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Because he's going to fix it now. No, that's not what it is. <laughs> Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. One of these themes we see run through the Psalms. God speaking to David's heart, giving him peace. Psalm 7. Again, a meditation of David, which he sang to the Lord, concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. Now, we don't have any specific detail in the, in the record in Scripture about who Cush is. We just know he's a Benjamite, and we know he gives David a lot of trouble. But, but he's going to pray about his situation with Cush. He says, O Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me, lest they tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver O oh Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is iniquity in my hands, if I have repaid evil to him who is at peace with me, or have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Yes, let him trample my life to the earth and lay my honor in the dust. Say that. Apparently, David is being accused of doing someone else wrong without reason. Right? Of repaying evil to someone who was at peace with him, of plundering his enemy without cause, taking things, stealing things. And David says, God, if I've done this, then, then judge me for it. Because David had not done this. He's being unfairly attacked. Look at verse 6. He says, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment you have commanded. So the congregation of the peoples shall surround you. For their sakes, therefore, return on high. David's praying not just for his own person, but for the sake of the people of Israel who, who, who he's leading. He, and he says, The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. Now look, David is not approaching God solely on the basis of his perfect behavior or righteousness. Right? But David's just pleading his cause in this issue. And he's saying, Lord, I didn't do the things that they're accusing me of here. Right? David understands that his righteousness ultimately has to come from God. He's just saying, Lord, I didn't do these things. And, and, and so he's pleading because of, um, uh, against these unfair accusations. And then verse 9, he says, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. But establish the just, for the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. My defense is of God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. That's a startling statement, isn't it? God is angry with the wicked every day. How should we think about that? Right? The New Testament tells us that God is love. First, or excuse me, John 3.16 For God so loved the world He gave His only begotten Son That whoever believes in Him would not perish But have everlasting life So how is it then also true That God is angry with the wicked every day Well I think the best way to understand that Is to consider what Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 2 He talks about the ungodly And he says of them He says In accordance with your hardness And your impenitent heart That is a a stubborn heart that's unchanging, unrepentant, right? In accordance with that, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. People who are stubbornly resisting God 
and continuing to live a wicked life. It's like Paul says, they're making payments, investments into an account. And it's the account of judgment. They're storing up for themselves wrath in the day of wrath, in the day of God's judgment. In other words, the idea is they live under the threat, the imminent threat of judgment from God. It's already there. It's, they're condemned people. They're just waiting for the day when the sentence is carried out. They're kind of like we think about people sitting on death row. They're already condemned. They're just waiting for the sentence to be carried out. That's the idea. And I think that's the idea that David gives us here. You are continually angry with the wicked. Judgment is coming against the wicked unless they repent. Look at verse 12. He says, if he does not turn back, and that's key, right? If he does not turn back, he, God, will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. David so often speaking in this warrior-like language because he was a soldier. He was a warrior. He says, Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. So, the judgment of the wicked here, and of Cush, David's enemy in this circumstance, is to have their own schemes come back and trip them up. Right? We see that's a constant theme through Scripture. One of God's judgments against the wicked is they fall into their own traps. The things that they try to do against the righteous, against God's people, against the Lord Himself, right? It comes back. And, and they find themselves, just like Haman in the book of Esther, set up a a place to hang Mordecai, and he swung from from that from that timber himself. Right? It's that idea. That's one of the judgments of God against the wicked. All right, Psalm eight. To the chief musician on the instrument of Gath, a Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. All right. So now we get it. We're, well, she will end here on Psalm eight. But so all these prayers of, of uh, repentance and of desperation and of seeking God. So up here in Psalm 8, we get a psalm of real praise. It's just praising God for his glory and for how awesome and incredible that he is. Right? O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. God, your glory is so great. It is so high. It is higher than the heavens. It's higher than the clouds. It's higher than the sky. Right? It's, it's higher than the moon. It's, it's beyond the stars. Higher than the heavens, the glory of God. And then he says this, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength. Here's one of those great contrasts that we see in the poetic language. God's glory is greater than all of creation, higher than the heavens. Right? But then he compares God's glory he's to, to, to the smallest child, an infant. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. In other words, I can see your glory and majesty, God, in the greatest of your creation, the highest heavens. Your, your glory is beyond that, but I also recognize, God, your power and your majesty. The tiniest child. You ever hold an infant? Have you ever walked outside at night and looked at the stars and been in awe and wonder of God's creation and His power and His beauty? And have you not had that same feeling when you've held a little two month old that just sort of nestles in and goes to sleep? A friend of mine used to say, when you hold a baby, nothing hurts. Right? It's just that. And David says, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. In other words, out of the mouth of babes, even a small child. Right? You have ordained strength. There's more wisdom, more power, more of God's glory displayed to the words of a child that praises him than in all the seemingly brilliant philosophies and schemes of God's enemies, of ungodly men. 
This is the verse that Jesus quoted to the religious rulers. Uh, remember, he rides into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday. But he rides into Jerusalem. He's hailed as the Messiah. The first thing he does is he goes to the temple. Right? And he's going to spend time in, over the next couple days in the temple teaching and ministering. But while he's there, the little kids are running around in the temple court. And they're still singing the song that everybody sang when he rode in on the donkey. Hosanna, 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 right? Save now, save now. Hailing him as the Messiah, worshiping him as the anointed one. And, and the religious rulers are furious. They're like, do you hear what they're saying? And they consider it blasphemy. And Jesus quotes this verse to defend the little children. Have you not heard it said, right? Out of the mouths of babes and nurse, nursing infants. In the New Testament it's quoted, you have perfected praise. Those children had more spiritual insight and a greater theology than the most educated religious rulers of Jesus' day because they failed to recognize him. Right? So the psalmist here, just in awe of God's power and majesty, seeing it in the, in the highest of the heavens and, and in the smallest child, and he says this, now verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, when I see these things, he calls the moon and the stars. He says, that's the work of your fingers, God. It's just, you just did that with your fingers. No great construction project for the Lord. He just sprinkled them out there. That's how great he is. He says, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. God, you're so great and you're, you're so majestic and yet, Lord, you pay attention to us. You have given a certain glory to mankind. You have made us a little lower than the angels and, and crowned us with glory and honor. I love that in 1 Peter 1.12, Peter indicates to us that the angels are actually curious about salvation. Like kind of, I think kind of the idea is they can't get their heads around it. Like, oh, why would you love this part? There's so much trouble. Why would you do so much for them? Why would you love them this way? Why would you give your son for them? Like, like something that angels desire to look into, Peter says. Right? Yet God's made us a little lower than the angels, yet he's, he's blessed us. He loves us. He, he's given us a, a certain glory and honor in creation. And, and he speaks of that here. He says... You have made him to, to have dominion, verse 6, over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. The psalmist did not have the modern idea that man is just one animal among many. He understood that, he was, that man is made in the image of God. God has given us dominion over the earth. And then he says, verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, he repeats it, how excellent is your name on all the earth. How excellent. The glory of God is displayed in every part of his creation, in every corner of his world. Amen. I think that's what we're going to do today. One, two, eight. Such encouragement. I pray you're encouraged. I pray you're motivated. I pray that your faith is built to worship Him well, to pray, to seek Him, to know that He will answer in time of need. Let, let's finish. we got to finish with a song. Father, we thank You so much for today. Father, we pray that we would indeed be strengthened in our faith by Your Word. That we would recognize who You are. That we would be bold to bring You, Lord, our prayers and our needs and to know that You're going to answer Thank you, Father, for so many testimonies of your faithfulness through your word. Lord, thank you that you hear our prayers, that you know the meditation of our heart. Lord, help us to worship you well today. Help us worship you well all week. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand if you will.